You know, I've been around for a while. I met some interesting people. Done some crazy things. So you just might think that there's not much that can take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories, science, and things that amaze and confound me. Every single day, incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night, some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Are aliens among us? In Colorado, a farmer makes a gruesome discovery. A cow is mutilated by technology beyond human comprehension. My first thought was, uh, they're back. Did aliens commit this ghastly crime? Across the world, thousands of people are being dragged from their beds in the middle of the night. Are they being abducted by extraterrestrials? There's nothing normal about these beings. And in the USA, an astronomer makes a remarkable discovery. A cryptic message from outer space. Could this be the first scientific evidence of alien contact? Yeah. It's a weird world. And I love it. Aliens exist. And what's more, they not only aim to take over our planet, they're already here. And they're breeding with us. You think I'm crazy? No. Yeah. Well, maybe. But think twice. More than 15 million Americans claim they've seen a UFO. And let's face it, most of us believe that aliens are somewhere out there. But now, all over the planet, weird, unexplainable, and sometimes horrific events are telling us something else. They're not only right here, they're up to no good. Weird or what? The San Luis Valley is a beautiful corner of Colorado, and home to hundreds of cattle ranchers just like Mike Duran. I grew up in the area here lived here all my life. But on March 8th, 2009, Mike's perfect world was shattered when one of his prized cows went missing. Last time we saw her was Friday for sure. Sunday when I came to feed, I noticed her little baby was by itself. So I went around the property looking for her and I did not find her. So I went on a ridge and on the ridge, I could see the whole property very, very good. Finally, Mike finds what he's looking for. But it's not good news. I figured while she came down, she just fell. She just died. Thought to myself, well, she's been a good cow. But on closer inspection, Mike makes a horrifying discovery. And that's when I noticed that her udders had been removed. And then I looked and also noticed that the female organ around the vaginal area had also been cut out. And it's weird because there's no blood around. There are no tracks. It appears Mike's cow has been brutally mutilated. But remarkably, this senseless crime isn't the only one. In the dead of night, someone or something crept onto the Martin property and removed the sex organs and other parts from a 700-pound steer. I don't see anything on this side. Garth Lamb had never seen anything like it. It appears to be something very sharp. During the last century, Cattle mutilation has been reported all over the world. The incidents are all chillingly similar. The animal's sexual organs, tongue, eyes, and ears are often missing. Its blood has been drained. And there is no evidence to identify the attacker. Mike believes he knows what is responsible for these vicious mutilations. The cuts are something that uh, you cannot just make with a knife or anything. It looks like it's cut and cauterized at the same time, like a laser cut. My first uh, thought was, uh, 
their back. I believe that it's not something from this world. Arkansas State Police Officer Sergeant Rick O'Kelly and Sergeant Doug Fogley are cow mutilation experts. They personally investigated nearly 40 identical cases in Washington County in 1979. We started having a rash of mysterious deaths of uh, livestock. And our job is to determine whether a crime has occurred. I got to review most of the cases in Arkansas, look at their photographs, and go to a few scenes. Uh, there were a lot of theories. Uh, a lot of people crawled out of the woodwork. But this was a crime they had never seen the likes of before. They decided to use detective work to try and solve it. Sheriff Herb Marshall came into my office and uh, outlined the experiment he wanted to do to determine, you know, what might be causing these cattle mutilations. Using surveillance cameras to study sick and dying cows from the moment of their death, they hoped the experiment would reveal how injuries in the mutilated animals might occur. What we were seeing within uh, just a couple of hours, these animals would start to bloat from the gases inside and that would force all their organs on the outside. The eye that was uh, turned up, that was exposed to the air, uh, it was missing, it was gone. The tongue was missing, and the sexual organs of the animal, they were, they were all gone. But could escaping gases account for other classic signs of mutilation? Could they produce the precise laser-like cuts Mike Durant found on his dead cow? There was a lot of talk about surgical incisions and things like that, but this was all done by flies. Anytime you have an animal like that that's laying out in the hot sun and it swells up and all its organs get pushed out through its anus, uh, you're going to have some blood out there and the blowflies cleaned it all up. I mean, this was a classic cattle mutilation. The flies would lay the eggs in the carcass and within just a very short period of time they'd hatch out into maggots and these things would, they're great surgeons. I mean, they, they took care of it very quickly. We were able to produce that in our experiment. There's no difference in the classic mutilation photos and the photos taken by Washington County. I'm absolutely positively convinced that uh, our experiment proved it beyond a shadow of a doubt, and the results for the past 30 years, I think, back that up. It's a compelling experiment, but questions remain. What killed seemingly healthy animals in the first place? And what about the lack of blood? Christopher O'Brien is an investigative journalist. He's been independently researching livestock mutilations since 1992. I find it very hard to believe that aliens are coming light years to harvest parts for lip and eye stew or udder souffle or for whatever reason. Somebody somewhere knows what is behind these perpetrators' agenda. Chris believes the answer is far more sinister. We have 350 reports, very good documented reports, of helicopter activity in and around cattle mutilation sites. And since then, we've had about 100 more. They are monitoring what I think is a scourge in the food chain, which is known as mad cow disease. Mad cow is a highly infectious and deadly disease that can spread from cows to humans with horrific results. When it's discovered in livestock, all hell breaks loose. Because of the pervasive spread of this disease in England, six million head of livestock was slaughtered. And if we do have mad cow loose in the food chain, it stands to reason that there's some quasi-military, possibly a government group, that's going around lifting these cattle from the pasture, doing environmental monitoring to find out how pervasive this is sweeping through cattle herds. Covert government choppers dragging cows away to be tested for mad cow disease. If the government ever let word out that they were doing this and that the food chain had been compromised, you could just imagine what the panic would be <laughs> in the red meat eating public. And that's not gonna happen. So let's think about this. What have we learned so far? Horrific cattle mutilations are taking place all over the planet. These mysterious and unthinkable crimes have so far been blamed on choppers, kidnapping, mystified animals in the middle of the night, part of a mad, mad cow conspiracy. And if you think that's hard to follow, others have believed the culprits for these heinous crimes are, are flies.
Maybe the idea that these were encounters with aliens isn't so crazy. Have I killed an alien? Worldwide, cattle are being mysteriously mutilated. Is E.T. responsible? The evidence that we have is that alien intelligences are actually sampling the environment through the removal of tissue and glands of animals on a global scale. Philip Hoyle is the director of the Animal Pathology Research Unit in the UK. He believes that not only are aliens guilty, they are more advanced than we can imagine. Some of the weirdest stories we hear from farmers that actually have these mutilations is they see spheres of light, and within those lights, what are clearly can only be described as UFOs, and they operate completely differently and unconventionally to any helicopters or any known aircraft. We have some evidence that the perpetrators are actually taking the animals from the farms by using special what we're called transference beams. These beams are an anti-gravity beam and if soon as the animal is placed in the beam they are taken on board the craft where the animals are obviously dissected and then placed back onto the ground. The materials that have been actually removed from the animals are then taken back obviously to another location, possibly off-world, to be used in whatever agenda that they might have. Transference beams might account for the lack of evidence surrounding the cows on the ground. But does Hoyle have an answer for the precision surgery? Yes. Some of the actual injuries that we've actually investigated, the te technology that's been used is quite frightening because some of the actual injuries would indicate the tissue has been unzipped, totally different to a scalpel would be used. So it's obviously far in advance of anything we have at the moment on planet Earth. It's clean, precise, clinical, straight line cuts. Sometimes we discover a black putty paste upon the carcass, and this paste, when analysed, is actually determined to be hem hemoglobin. It's actually been separated. The white and red corpuscles have been separated by a centrifuge. And that can only be done in a laboratory. Predators can't do it. Philip Hoyle is not only convinced he's right, he thinks the other theories are crazy. If maggots have caused these injuries, what happens um, when an animal's found within minutes or hours or the last time it's been seen? What's responsible for that? Super maggot? So if aliens are abducting and mutilating our innocent, beloved cows, what do they want with them? I think there is a number of alien intelligences who have a vested interest in planet Earth and humanity, and they are monitoring the food chain and the environment through the sampling of genetic materials and tissues taken from animals. So I think that they're not hostile, and they have really got our interest at heart, because if they didn't, we wouldn't be here today. In the end, we are left with more questions than answers. Are cows being mutilated as part of a government conspiracy? Are their injuries the result of natural causes? Or are aliens plotting to take over the planet? This is a true mystery. This is weird, people. This is weird. Or what? I sleep like a baby. In fact, there's nothing that can wake me up save for, uh, well, never mind. But across the world, for hundreds, indeed thousands of people, sleep is a living nightmare. These chosen ones have been woken up in the middle of the night, dragged from their beds and taken to somewhere. It's strange. Where are they going? And who? <gasps> oh! No, no, they're not there, not there! Jim Sparks is a very down-to-earth kind of guy. I've always been considered to be an honest, uh, logical, straightforward person. But in 1969, he experienced a string of events that would threaten his hold on reality. I kept having the same reoccurring dream, where some things were coming into my bedroom, escorting me out of my bed, uh, through the hallway, and across the yard into the woods. At first, Jim tries to dismiss the dreams as nothing out of the ordinary. 
but they soon turn into something far more sinister. I would be asleep, and I would be instantly paralyzed, and I would hear this uh, loud, uh, whipping, whirling sound inside my head. I was paralyzed, so I couldn't jump up out of bed until the sound was just screaming in my head. And then I felt, would feel a sensation uh, coming up from the pit of my stomach, working its way up to my upper torso. And once it hit the area of my heart, my heart would race, you know, like a thousand miles an hour is what it felt like. And um, these sensations were gut-wrenching, and I would be screaming inside my head because I couldn't get my vocal cords to work. I don't want to die, I don't want to die. And then you feel a sense of acceleration, and it scared me to death. So you scream inside your head, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, and then you black out. When Jim eventually wakes up, he can't believe where he is. I was uh, in this room, um, and light was emanating from everywhere, but nowhere specifically. Try to imagine yourself, this average person, finding yourself in a room not knowing where the heck you are and why you're even there. But the one thing Jim does know is he is not alone. Everything was weird. There's nothing normal about these beings. Um, they do things in a very methodical, business-like fashion. They're fast, they're quick, they're to the point and they're going to tell you things and when they when they decide to, to shed information it's not always what you want to hear they did a variety of experiments there were mental experiments physical experiments uh, medical experiments it was horrifying it was scary uh, i didn't know what was going on i didn't understand what was going on i just knew that something for the first time in my life paranormal was taking place and I just had no, I couldn't, uh, I had no frame of reference. I couldn't figure what it was. I had no clue that they were aliens. All I was doing was yelling and screaming is, where am I? Where am I? Why am I here? Who's doing this to me? Suddenly, Jim is no longer an ordinary man. He now has an extraordinary claim. I've been abducted many dozens and dozens and dozens of times in the, over the last 23 years. I understand that um, there's going to be doubters, but this is real. Susan Clancy is a Harvard psychology researcher. She believes alien abductions are easily explained. Could it be aliens came into your room and took you or touched you or performed sexual experiments? It could be, but it's far more likely that it's an episode of sleep paralysis. Sleep paralysis is a little known medical condition that affects one in five Americans. Sleep paralysis is one of the weirdest things that can happen when you're sleeping. In our research, interviewing people who had sleep paralysis experience, most people don't think it was linked to alien abduction. But most people also do report that they wanted to know what it was. And the explanations they generated on their own, for example, I'm going crazy, I'm dying, I'm having a heart attack, um, there's a robber in the house, and then, of course, there's also the alien abduction possibility. I experienced sleep paralysis once. I was actually writing on sleep paralysis, and I had a new baby, and I was on my couch trying to finish a paper, and I fell asleep. And when I woke up sometime in the middle of the night, I was spinning in the air like a rotisserie chicken, and there were presences in the room, and I remember thinking, it's real. It's all real. People really are being abducted. Sleep paralysis is likely to occur when you have a disruption of your sleep cycles. So for example, if you're jet lagged, or if you're a new mom uh, up all night with your kids, or if you're on the night shift. During sleep, neurotransmitters in the brain send out signals that shut down major muscles and prevents us from acting out our dreams. So essentially, you're paralyzed when you're sleeping, which is very good. Otherwise, you'd be thrashing around and beating up your partner, et cetera, et cetera. But this self-defense mechanism can backfire when your brain wakes up before your body. This behavior has been shown in clinical trials. When you experience sleep paralysis and you wake up, you're still experiencing the paralysis that accompanies sleep. 
So it really is this limbo state where your two sleep cycles, sleep and awake, have temporarily overlapped. You are aware of being awake, but you're still sleeping in the sense that you're paralyzed. Now imagine this, on top of that, when you experience the sleep paralysis, you were dreaming. So imagine what happens when you're having a dream, the visual images going through your head, the feelings you have. Those visual images, those feelings, that kind of dream mentation is going to leak into your waking state. It is a terrifying experience. Are thousands of people who claim to be abducted by aliens simply victims of sleep paralysis? Or can these bizarre stories be explained by something else. Neuroscientist Dr. Michael Persinger believes he has solved the mystery with a remarkable invention known as the God Helmet. The helmet has little devices that generate magnetic fields. They are pulsed through the brain at very weak intensities, very much like putting your face in front of a computer screen. Is what controls them are, is a computer program, special software that translates a series, a series of numbers from 0 to 256 through an analog to digital converter to the pattern. And the pattern we extracted from the brains of people who were having, or at least reporting, these kinds of experiences. So we replicate nature. The God Helmet was designed to discover why our brains are so receptive to religious experiences. But during a series of experiments in 2005, Persinger discovered it produced something unexpected and weird. And it says you felt the presence of something. Yeah, there's like other things around me. I would say the vast majority say it's an alien thing of something. It's not theirs. These volunteers claimed they were seeing alien entities in the room. Persinger believes these visions were produced when electricity from the God Helmet stimulated the temporal lobes on one side of the brain. So here's a human brain. It's shrunk a bit because it's been fixed. But you can see that you have a, a left side and a right, two hemispheres. It's only when we stimulate the right hemisphere that people start to report these entities. So what is it about the right side of our brains that can create lifelike aliens? Let's see if I can explain. The left and right sides of our brains are noticeably different. If I ask the left side of my brain, who am I? It would answer with words smart, charming, handsome, all those obvious things. But if I asked the right side of my brain, who am I? It couldn't answer. You see, the right hemisphere doesn't understand language. It only recognizes and stores shapes and images. Fair enough. But what's this got to do with aliens? Many of the images stored in the right hemisphere of the brain represent ourselves. Persinger believe stimulating this area causes them to be projected, seemingly outside of the body, as aliens. When you're aware of it, it feels like an alien type of sense of self. It could be uh, described, depending upon the culture, everything from an incubus or a succubus to an, an angel to a demon, uh, to even in terms of contemporary context in, the, in our space-oriented society, an alien. But there's just one problem. People like Jim Sparks weren't sleeping with brain-bending helmets on their heads. So how did they see aliens? Some people are more prone to it than others. These individuals pick up all kinds of small alterations in the environment. And what triggers it can be something as minor as simply a single neuron. Now, what makes that neuron fire? Well, sometimes it's the intrinsic electrical sensitivity of the person. Sometimes it can be external magnetic fields. They occur from tectonic strain before earthquakes or during geomagnetic storms. That's why you often have large numbers of people reporting these experiences because large numbers of people are being stimulated at the same time. Artists, writers, musicians are very markedly prone to these kinds of experiences. In the ancient days, they were called the muse. You were visited by the muse from another dimension that gave you special inspiration or knowledge or even precognitive type of experiences. Today, of course, we call them alien experiences, and they're just as real to the person as the muses were to the poets of the past. Are alien abductions simply a trick of the mind? Or could they be true? 
One man believes we should be very afraid. Temple University professor David Jacobs has spent his life studying alien abductions. He's come to an incredible conclusion. On your side. I was not a great believer in abductions when I began this work, uh, and uh, now the evidence has persuaded me that alien abductions are real. Over three decades, Jacob's research has stacked up numbers which are impossible to ignore. I have looked at approximately 1,100 different abduction events. Uh, with about 150 people. They know that there's absolutely nothing to gain by coming to my house and saying that they've been abducted by people from another dimension or planet or whatever it is. Uh, it's all downside, there's no upside. It makes them look crazy, they don't want their names used, they don't want, they don't want people to know uh, that they're even coming here. Uh, I have worked with people who refuse to tell me their names. They, they just work on their fake name altogether, and I understand that. People are abducted, with their families, they are abducted with strangers, they are abducted in groups. People can verify each other's abductions. Should we believe the claims of thousands of victims of alien abduction? And if so, why is E.T. coming to Earth? You know, lots of people uh, believe that this is a benevolent phenomenon, that these are loving, caring light beams who are concerned with our well-being. But Jacobs believes the aliens have a much more sinister purpose. People have unusual experiences related to UFOs, and they can't remember what happened to them. There might be a two, three, four hour missing time period that they cannot, they can't account for. And nobody else around them can account for it either. Are aliens erasing the memory of their victims? Why? Jacobs believes he can find the answer using hypnosis. I feel I'm sliding out of the bed. Are you alone at this time? No, I feel like there's something around me, beings, and they're on either side of me. I'm scared, I think. When I'm under hypnosis, I remember being examined, some sort of medical exam or some sort of medical procedure. All abductees say the same thing. They are required to lie on a table. Uh, and when they do that, a series of physical, reproductive, and mental um, procedures are performed upon them. They have a staring procedure whereby uh, a gray alien will stare directly into their eyes from a distance of an inch or maybe even touching foreheads. They cannot close their eyes. They can't shift their eyes. Uh, and they can feel a, a, a sort of something happening in their mind. It might be flashes of images. It might be an evocation of feelings. It might be all sorts of things that these beings want to have happen. If it's a woman, eggs are taken. If it's a man, sperm is taken. Why would aliens perform these brutal acts? When Jacobs digs deep, he uncovers something bizarre. Yeah, yeah. There was one experience I can remember um, with um, a small baby. I don't know what you would call it. The baby that I was holding was very um, pale colored. Um, seemed very weak to me um, and didn't have a lot of hair um, and I felt like I was comforting it um, somehow so that was my experience with this this baby and it was you know it's a small fleeting memory in the entire experience and it was um, it was puzzling to me because I didn't understand it they all described unusual looking babies or children who look sort of like a cross between alien and human there was a spectrum. Some looked more human and others looked more alien. Jacobs believes there can only be one answer. Aliens are breeding with humans. Why are all sorts of people describing this? We think that this is an integration program into the society. Why it's an integration into the, pro into the society, I don't know. We don't know that. That is the main question in abduction research now, why? Abductees are not told why, and therefore we don't know why. Now, if this were psychological, we'd know why. They just make it up like they're making everything else up. Uh, and we'd have a variety of whys, but we, we really do not know why. It's adding up to uh, the exploitation of one species over another. I fear for my kids and everybody else's kids. I fear for the set for the generations coming up. I, I don't think that they're going to be leading the lives that they think they're going to be leading. 
Are aliens abducting innocent people in order to create a breeding program and take over the planet? Are they walking amongst us? Whatever the answer, this story is definitely weird or what? August 1977. A mega telescope records what could be the most important broadcast in history. Could this be the first proof of contact with alien life? Weird or what? If we're to believe that, not only do aliens exist, but they're here and breeding half human, half alien children. Most sane, normal people are going to want something more concrete than some theories by, uh, sorry, nut jobs. We're looking for something a little more substantial, like scientific proof, right? Well, here it is. In 1977, Jerry Amon was a university professor with a unique hobby, hunting for alien life. I was actually a volunteer at the Ohio State University Radio Observatory. Jerry's job was to study data from a giant telescope called the Big Ear. Acting like a giant radio antenna, Big Ear hoped to receive a message from outer space. But finding a needle in a cosmic haystack wasn't easy. I had been looking at the printout for many months, uh, but seeing nothing significant. After years of little more than radio silence, at 10.16 p.m. on August 15, 1977, the big ear suddenly came to life. For the next 72 seconds, it would pump out a message that could ultimately change the world. I looked at the computer output, and just within a two or three pages, I saw the signal. This was so unusual. Normally, printouts from the big ear contained a few ones and twos, representing weak signals from the lifeless vacuum of space. But what Jerry saw could only be described as weird. I saw 6EQUJ5, a sequence of numbers and letters, representing a signal that was rising, reaching a peak, and then falling off. I called the director of the radio observatory. We decided to start looking up known uh, sources of radio waves, uh, planets, satellites, anything we could think of. Nothing matched, not a thing. So I circled it and wrote the word wow. Since we couldn't identify it with anything else, we just started calling it the wow signal. A 72 second message sent to Earth from someone or something deep in outer space? Jerry's right, wow. Is this what we've been waiting for? Is the wow signal the first indisputable scientific proof that we are not alone? If so, who sent it? And what did it say? Let's think about this for a minute. If you were an alien making contact with Earth, wouldn't you like to make more of a grand entrance? Like they do in movies? Why bother with something low-tech? You wouldn't put a record on a spacecraft and send it out in some random direction at a relatively slow speed. Uh, you know, if you really want to talk to the neighbors <laughs> on, on other star systems, you, you, you send a signal at the speed of light. Dr. David Grinspoon is an astrobiologist. He believes the WOW signal is something we should be very excited about. It seems quite possible to me that the WOW signal really is uh, communication from an extraterrestrial intelligence. Did E.T. really call us? And what is it about the wow signal that makes Grinspoon so sure? 
It's a narrow band signal, which means all of that energy is in one little radio frequency. It's not spread out. You go a little bit on the dial, one direction or the other, and, there, and there's nothing there. Naturally occurring radio waves travel across space in a wide range of frequencies. Narrowband signals are concentrated into one channel, which lets them travel vast distances. But if the wow signal really is a message from an advanced alien civilization, where are they? Well, we, we know what direction it, it came from. It, uh, it came from um, a uh, point in the sky in the constellation Sagittarius. Sagittarius is a group of stars we can see from the Earth on summer nights. If Grinspoon is right, it could mean the wow signal came from somewhere close within our own galaxy. We're now discovering all these planets around other stars, so we know enough to know that there are, are billions of planets out there in the galaxy, and there's got to be life out there, and, and probably lots of it. Remarkably, there's even more mystery surrounding this amazing event. If an alien race did send us a radio beam, they only did it once. We were hoping that the signal would repeat itself, so we covered that strip of sky close to 100 times and didn't see anything again. Astronomer Dan Wertheimer has analyzed the WOW signal. He thinks he has the answer. It's an interesting signal, and I'm very proud of what these guys did. They were pioneers early on in the 70s, but I don't think they found ET. But if Jerry Amon didn't find proof of extraterrestrial life, what exactly did he find? A radio telescope is very sensitive, so anything passing over the beam of the telescope we can detect. But it's also unfortunately sensitive to signals that can come in from the side. The radio pollution comes from people with cell phones, television transmitters, radar, airplanes. Every second, human technology produces billions of radio waves. On a radio telescope, most of them are seen as random energy. But the wow signal was a concentrated signal over 72 seconds long. Could anything man-made produce something similar? The answer is yes. And that kind of thing can come from a satellite passing over the dish. As it gets near to the dish, it gets stronger. It could right go over the dish, it's very strong. And then as it moves away from the dish, it gets weaker. We have hundreds of these things that look very similar to the wow signal, but they're not ET. Did Jerry Amon mistake a satellite for a message from aliens? It's certainly a plausible explanation, but there's just one big problem. We investigated you know, all known satellites, and none were in the area at the time of our observation. Could they have missed something? Could there have been a secret military satellite in the area? A satellite closer in, three, four hundred miles off the Earth's surface, would have moved so rapidly, we wouldn't have got the beam shape that we observed. So, if it's not a satellite, if it's not some guy on a cell phone, or a bad 70s rerun, and if it's not a broadcast from aliens, what else could possibly produce a signal that makes us go, wow? Caleb Sharp is an astronomer who peers into the deepest regions of space. He has seen things that make him believe neither man nor alien made the wow signal. There's a lot of weird stuff happening in the universe. The universe, it may look quiet when you're standing outside on a, on a peaceful night, but the truth is there are phenomena in the universe that are explosive, violent, and changing all the time. And sometimes we see that energy as bursts of radio emission, even bursts of X-ray light. The space weirdos Caleb refers to are things like neutron stars, the leftover cores of once great stars, and supernovas, the explosive results of when even bigger stars die. But one of the weirdest are black holes. We think that black holes form when a really massive star burns through all its fuel and can no longer support itself against the force of gravity. 
its own weight crushes it. The truth is, as material drops into a black hole, and gets shredded by the intense gravitational field, it releases energy back out into the universe. And that energy can be in the form of X-rays, of light, and of radio waves. It's as if, after the black hole has a meal, it burps. And that burp can be heard across the universe. So, the wow signal, the thing that we thought might be the first message from an advanced intergalactic civilization. And one of the greatest moments in human history is just a black hole belching after gulping down a nebula. Too fast? Is this guy for real? And does it explain the biggest mystery of all? Why we only heard the wow signal once? I'm not sure it does. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are many phenomena out there that may only happen once in a human lifetime. So imagine you're in a big stadium. There are 20,000 people around you, and they all have cameras with flashes. You'll see a flash, and you'll try to locate it. The problem is, it's almost impossible to know exactly who used their camera at that moment. The wow signal is kind of like that. But we know that there are many incredibly interesting phenomena in the universe, like neutron stars getting cranky, black holes burping, that do just this. It's like flashes going off in a stadium, and we're at the center, we're trying to understand what's happening. Is the wow signal just some freaky radio transmission from Earth? Was it the bizarre burp of a black hole? Or could it be the first real proof of alien life? Whatever the truth, it's definitely weird. Or what? So there we have it. Strange and mysterious stories of encounters with aliens. In Colorado, a farmer discovers a cow, mysteriously mutilated by unknown forces. In Texas, a man is taken from his bed, night after night, abducted and experimented on by beings he cannot comprehend. And in Ohio, an astronomer receives a cryptic message from outer space. Are these bizarre stories evidence of human encounters with aliens? Can we dismiss thousands of eyewitnesses who claim they're true? You decide. Join me again next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what?